Welcome to Geography. This is your Unit 2 Introduction Notes. That means we are done with Unit 1, uh, which was a basic introduction to geography. Uh, now each unit is going to be specific to a region of the world. Uh, we'll call them cultural regions instead of continents. Uh, so this first cultural region that we're going to be talking about here for Unit 2 is the United States and Canada. Now you notice the key difference. I didn't say North America. Uh, Mexico was going to be in part of Unit 3. Uh, even though Mexico is part of North America, culturally Mexico is more similar to Latin America. And so we're going to study Mexico with Latin America. So we're, we're breaking up this course by cultural regions. And so the United States and Canada are much more culturally alike, and so we study them together. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next week or so, two weeks. Um, so the introduction notes you'll get used to as well. Each unit we start, uh, we start with these introduction notes, and they cover uh, some fundamentals of that region. So the two parts of geography that we're studying in this course is physical geography and human geography. You can see on the screen now, you see human geography. Um, oh, better turn on the pointer. There she is. Does it move? It's not moving on my screen. Maybe we won't be doing a pointer. Anyway, um, so we're going to be studying human geography and physical geography, an overview of the region. So here's Canada, United States. Let's talk about human geography first. So let's go to our first slide here. We're talking about history. History uh, is part of human geography. So we're talking about, again, history. Canada and the United States. So when we look at the early times, let's see, can you see my pointer? No. Can you see my laser? Doesn't move still. Okay, I thought maybe a new slide and my pointer would show here. Just Talking to talk. Okay, um, early times. So uh, you have a bunch of hunters that migrated to North America, uh, essentially over Beringia. Uh, Beringia is the area that um, during the Ice Age was A, either covered with ice or the Ice Age had sucked up enough water in the earth to uh, lower the oceans. Uh, anyway, there was a land that connected Alaska to Russia. Right now, they're in really there's places where it's only a few miles apart, or there's islands in there uh, where the United States, in terms of Alaska and Russia, really aren't that far apart. Uh, but they used to be connected up there. And that is the most widely accepted theory. Uh, obviously, nobody was around back then, so we have to call it a theory. But there's substantial evidence uh, that would say and Substantial evidence would point to this being the most likely theory of how people got to the United States and Canada, and all of North and South America for that matter. But uh, it used to be connected up there. People, hunters uh, were hunting, you know, woolly mammoth, other animals of the time. Uh, they crossed over uh, and then ended up populating North and South America. So you've got hunters that migrated to the region from Asia over 10,000 years ago. Every once in a while, you'll, I think it was just, I think it was this summer, I was reading an article about a new, uh, new archaeological discovery uh, where they found some very old human remains up in Alaska. Um, you know, that even, and they've done um, genetic testing on old uh, bodies that they've found uh, that are, you know, 5,000 years old, 2,000 years old, just a, a very old uh, remains and they can test them, date them, um, and then also genetic test them. Um, and they found links to common, uh, they found common genetic links between current Native, Native Americans uh, and 
these old remains that they found. Anyway, getting off topic here. This is why my notes are so long. Um, so that's early times. Flying through here. We move up to the colonial period. We get a bunch of Europeans coming over. Um, the United States gets its independence from Great Britain in the 1770s. Um, you may be able to tell by my surroundings. I also teach uh, U.S. history. So uh, 1776 to be exact. Well, we declared independence in 1776. Anyway, staying on topic. Uh, Canada uh, was also colonized uh, by both France and Great Britain. Um, and Canada got full independence in 1931. Now, Great Britain had kind of learned its lesson from its dealings with the United States and other places around the world. So, uh, Canada is still considered a Commonwealth uh, part of Great Britain. So, they never had to fight a war for independence, uh, they were just given it. But technically, uh, they do still honor the Queen of England as their queen in Canada. Australia is the same way. Now, they have a completely separate government, uh, nothing that the Queen, the Queen doesn't have any power over Canada uh, or Australia, uh, but they're all, uh, they all are considered part of the Commonwealth. And if you want more information about that, you're gonna have to look it up yourself because my notes are getting too long. Um, so we move into the modern era now, uh, where Canada and the United States are the biggest trading partners for each other. They trade a lot. Uh, the United States gets more stuff from Canada than anywhere else. Canada gets more stuff from the United States than anywhere else. Uh, very close ties and very close friendship between the two countries, very culturally linked. Okay, let's take a look at population. Uh, that's another part of human geography. So. This is uh, combining the United States and Canada. There are 366 million people, um, about not quite 40 million in Canada, like 30, 38 million people in Canada, uh, and the rest of the United States. So on a global scale, this is about 6% of the world lives in the United States and Canada, and 80% of the people in these two countries live in urban areas, in cities. In fact, most Canadians live along the U.S. border. Uh, I think it's 90% of Canadians live within 100 miles of the United States. So most Canadians live very close to the United States. Don't, uh, don't get a big head. Don't get a big ego. Don't, it's uh, not because they are all uh, infatuated with the United States. Uh, maybe there's some of that involved, but really climate-wise, it's the warmest parts of Canada are on the southern border. So um, if you think about the United States, our most populous state is California, because uh, it could be easily argued that that state has the nicest weather. Even though California borders Mexico, um, I don't get the idea that most people move to California to be closer to Mexico. And I don't get the idea that most people in Canada move closer to the United States to be part of the United States. It's uh, it's a weather thing, but it does help uh, bring our two countries closer because you know they live so close to us for the most part. Uh, to take a look at this map. This is another pretty interesting map. I bet it will surprise some of you. 50% um, of Canadians live south of the Green Line. So even me, myself, uh, I'm in West Fargo here. So that's like, ah, shoot, I don't, my laser's not working. Oh, there it is. It's working. So, you know, I'm West Fargo, we're talking like right here. We are north of the Green Line in West Fargo. And uh, so half of all Canadians live south of this Green Line. So half of the entire population. So that's almost 20 million people live in this area here. So when you think about Canada, you oftentimes think, Oh gosh, I don't want to go to Canada. It's so cold. Whereas most Canadians live in areas that are further south than where I live in the United States. Here's a population density map. Um, holy smokes. We're already up to 10 minutes. I really need to start going through this faster. Um, so population density based on the color here shows you where people are living um, per square mile. 
So if you want to pause and take a look at this, if you want to pause it and take a break, uh, I'm not opposed to that. Again, every 10 minutes or so, I think uh, it's good for you to stand up, walk around your desk, uh, do a couple jumping jacks, go pet your dog, go say, uh, don't don't bug your brother or sister. They're probably doing homework too. Um, but uh, just, uh, it's been 10 minutes. If you want to pause and take a little break, by all means, please do so. Sorry the notes are getting so long. We got a lot left. <laughs> Well, I hope you paused it and took a little break. Uh, we're back now. I'm back now. Um, let's talk culture, another part of human geography. So the culture in Canada, uh, they have two official languages, both French and English. Part of uh, Canada, you will drive through and all the signs will be in French. And then you'll keep driving all of a sudden all the signs are in English. So there are, depending on what part of Canada you're in, uh, they have two official languages. Uh, Christian, Christianity is the largest religion. Um, in terms of ethnicity, 65% of the people there are of European descent. Uh, a lot of French and British, other European. 4% uh, native, in, indigenous Canada. The United States does not have an official language. Uh, most people speak English. One out of six Americans don't speak English as their main language. Uh, Christianity is the largest religion. Uh, but there are 5 million people that follow Judaism or Islam, um, 2 to 3 million Buddhists, 2.5 million Hindus. In terms of ethnicity, 67% of European descent. So uh, actually, Canada is slightly more diverse. Um, Latin America is the fastest growing group. 12% uh, African Americans, 4% Asian, 1% Native. Okay, only a minute on that, minute and a half on that slide. Let's uh, keep on going. Ooh, economic activity. I think in your notes, you have to write a little something about this. Uh, I wonder if I can take my picture down for you. I don't know if I can. Um, I don't know if that's working for you or not. I so anyway, um, you might wanna pause the video, kind of study this a little bit and then write down what you notice. Um, you know, some of it's kind of obvious uh, how things are used. So, like, the blue here is commercial fishing. Well, obviously, there's no commercial fishing in the Midwest. So, you got the blue, the commercial fishing is all along uh, the waterways out here. Um, hunting and gathering is the purple. Green is forestry. Uh, commercial farming. Uh, this would take a big part of, um, you know, where I grew up, where you're growing up in West Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, but go ahead and pause this, take a second, um, and then just write a sentence in your notes about what you notice, uh, what resources, where they're at, stuff like that. All right, uh, so now uh, a little section of the PowerPoint here that's not, that you don't have to write anything down for. You can just uh, absorb and learn. Um, so you want to speak Canadian, A. Eh? I'll do my best here. I'm not actually from Canada, but uh, you want to speak Canadian. Uh, this are their dollar coins. Okay, in the United States, there is a dollar coin, but it's not used very much. But in Canada, uh, you'll find these are used pretty regularly. So uh, this is the one dollar coin. It has a loon on it, so they call it a loony. And this coin is worth two dollars. Now. Uh, it has a bear on it, but they call it, because it's $2, it's a toonie. So you've got loonies and toonies. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, they are called the Mounties. Oh, poutine. Uh, this, you are, this delicacy you are lucky to hear about, I guess. I don't know. Uh, they take French fries. They put cheese curds in it and then smother it in beef gravy and you get poutine. It is mwah, delicious. I'd say in the last five or so years, you've started seeing this a lot more in the United States, even especially, well, definitely here in North Dakota because we're pretty close to Canada. Uh, my, if you have a friend in Canada that owns a bar, 
and they have their own poutine. They use um, nacho cheese instead of cheese curds, so it's not technically official poutine. You have to have actual cheese curds and gravy, um, but there are variations. But uh, yeah, it's good. Might not look good. Your your opinion on that, but taste good. Okay, so uh, what do you think they put ketchup on in Canada? They put ketchup on potato chips, ketchup flavored potato chips, very popular. So if ketchup goes on the potato chips, what do you dip your french fries in? Oh, just a little vinegar and mayo. Mix that up, dip your fries in, and it's good. I haven't had that myself. Okay, uh, back to the real notes. Let's talk about physical geography. So that means we're halfway done, um, done with human geography. Now we're gonna do physical geography. We're at 16 minutes. Oh man, I feel really bad, but I uh, will try to go quick. 10 slides left. Okay, now nine slides left. Some fun facts, the highest point is Mount Denali. Uh, for a long time, it was known as Mount McKinley. It's up here in Alaska. Excuse me. Um, and so Mount McKinley, I'm, I'm a, like I said earlier, I'm a U.S. history teacher, so I should probably know this, but I'm guessing when the United States took, bought, Alaska, we bought Alaska from Russia. Um, I wonder if McKinley was the president of the United States at that time. If I had to guess, if I was a trivia guy, I would guess uh, McKinley was our president at the time. Maybe not. Maybe they just liked the guy and named it after him. But anyway, um, the mountain was originally called Denali by the natives. Uh, it was, the name was changed to Mount McKinley for quite 60 years or so. And just recently, I think when uh, in the last 15, I think Obama was president and the name was changed back to Denali. Uh, anyway, that's uh, the highest point in the United States and Canada is Denali, 20,000 feet above sea level. The lowest point is in Death Valley, California. It's somewhere in this area here, inland California. Uh, if you ever watch like the national news, they'll do like the, the national weather, they'll have the highs and the lows. Death Valley is almost always the hottest point uh, in the United States on any given day. And the longest river is the Mississippi River, 3,900 miles long. Physical features. Hey, we are going quicker now. Okay, the Canadian Shield is a giant area, it covers almost half of Canada, and Canada is a big country. Uh, so it's not like uh, an, not like uh, Captain America Shield. The Canadian Shield, a shield is a geographic term for the large core of very old rock. Okay, similar to our geography here in North Dakota, uh, we had glaciers come through. Canada uh, also was shaped pretty much by glaciers. Now, depending on where you're at, how those glaciers were moving, it created a lot of different geographic features. So where we live here in the Red River Valley of North Dakota in the United States, it left a lot, the uh, glacier dropped a lot of good dirt um, or left a lot of good dirt for raising plants, uh, crops. But in the Canadian Shield, so for half of Canada, really uh, the glacier scraped off the good dirt and just left rock and very old rock. And so it's you can't grow plants there because again, it's rock. Um, so the, oh, look, I guess I could have just read this. Uh, glaciers scraped the soil from the shield. Uh, it also dug the holes that made the Great Lakes, which is the world's largest group of freshwater lakes. Uh, this one you already know, Denali is the highest peak in North America. It's part of the Alaskan range. Oh, we're being repetitive now. Uh, okay, so there's two major mountain ranges. Uh, on the eastern side, you have the Appalachian Mountains, and on the western side, you have the Rocky Mountains. Uh, not that creative in naming. The Rocky Mountains are much more rocky. Um, so the Appalachians are also a much older mountain range. Okay? And so over time, that rock has been on the surface for a much longer time, and they have eroded. 
Uh, and so they become gentle, rounded peaks, deep valleys, uh, covered in trees um, and plants. And so oftentimes people will like to, it's hard to find things there because of the tree cover. Uh, on the western part of the continent, you have the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it's jagged, rocky, snow-capped peaks, um, newer mountains in terms of features of Earth. Uh, and so they're still, still much more jagged. Uh, between them, you find the Great Plains, which is pretty dry, not many trees, and a flat region good for growing plants. Uh, the Mississippi River drains the Great Plains, and all of that flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Hey, that's uh, the 20 minute mark. If you want to pause here and take a little break, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, every 10 minutes, I think it's good for you to get up, move around a little bit. So uh, if you want to pause the video here, take a little break, do some jumping jacks, run around your house, whatever you're going to do. Um, you know, take a minute or so, uh, take some deep breaths and relax yourself, uh, and then come back and we'll talk about climate. All right, welcome back. Uh, climate for Canada and Alaska. Uh, so in the northern part here is the tundra and subarctic climates. Uh, we learned about those in unit one, all the different climate zones. So uh, very cold, very little, gr very little grows here. Uh, on the southern border of Canada, you get a humid continental. That'd be very similar to what, uh, what the climate is in northern, north central United States. Uh, and then a marine west coast, uh, rainy, uh, not too hot, not too cold. Uh, think uh, the Seattle, Vancouver area. So the climate in the United States is varied. I like to say very varied, extremely varied climates. We have so many different climates in the United States. So humid subtropical, uh, we're talking Florida, Everglades, uh, very warm, tropical wet and dry, also um, southern, um, southern Florida more. Um, arid, we're getting desert-like. So Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, uh, Semi-air is going to be the areas around there, getting into California, other parts of Arizona. Highlands climate, when we're in class, this is the one I like to trick you on. Uh, but highlands, if you remember from your notes in Unit 1, highlands, I would, if we were in class, I'd say, hey, uh, what's the highlands climate like, random student? And then that random student, not remembering all 20 climate zones from the first unit, would be like, uh, I don't know. But the Highlands doesn't really have a definition. Highlands just is uh, like in the mountains. The top of the mountain, it's really cold. The bottom of the mountain might be really nice. So um, a Highlands climate just depends on how high you are. Uh, but California alone has five different climate zones. Um, so lots of different types of climate in the United States. And that has to do with our latitudes, the part of the world where we are located and, and how big of an area we have. Okay, that's enough about climate. Let's talk about vegetation. What type of plants live? Uh, usually it will depend on the climate zone. Uh, so, tundra, uh, frozen, treeless desert, very north. Coniferous forests. Coniferous forests, uh, they're called, the easiest way to remember this is uh, because it's they have cones, like pine cones. Those are coniferous trees. And so you've got coniferous forests, evergreens uh, that cover most of the north. Again, we're talking now, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is vegetation for Canada and Alaska. So uh, coniferous forest. Then when you get into the southern border, uh, you'll find a mixed forest where there's uh, both coniferous and deciduous. I don't have a, I don't know why it's deciduous. I need to study up on my Latin. Uh, but so you've got two different types of trees, coniferous and deciduous. That makes a mixed forest. You'll find this in southeastern Canada. For the United States vegetation, again, uh, because of our latitudes, where we live, 
so many different climate zones equals so many different uh, vegetation zones as well. So you've got tropical palms, you've got desert sagebrush, uh, everything in between. So from desert to tropical to mixed forest, it, it all depends on where you're living. Uh, but you've got a ton of different climate zones. And I think that's the end of our notes. Uh, so 25 minutes, I think that's actually better than last week. I promise I'll get better. Um, but imagine if you were in class, it'd be, this would be a 47 minute class. So 25 minutes, not bad. Anyway, uh, that's the introduction to unit two, uh, United States and Canada. So that'll be kind of the focus here for the next couple of weeks. And now you know the basics. Uh, so make sure you got those notes filled out and you can submit them and uh, have a great day.